this is me on the other side of this continent in Egypt, testing and experimenting with my first solar machine, the Sun Cutter. Every day I took a taxi from my hotel into the barren wilderness of this stony desert, hoping that the driver remembered, as promised, to come back once the sun had set. <laughs> the idea was simple, almost child's play, burning leaves with a magnifying glass, or in this case, burning through thin sheets of plywood with a spherical lens to make sunshades with the power of the sun. The machine was an exploration into 1800s machinery, which heavily relied on cam systems. Cams were used to create repeated motion or actuation, and some of the finest watchmakers of the time um, made incredible puppets that could write poems or draw pictures purely by mechanical means, having pre-digital hard drives made of complex cams driving the motion. In my design, there were only two cams, one for the x-axis and one for the y-axis mechanically driving a platform below the spherical lens. The simplicity here was key to this project as the machine got away without much electricity. Only a small solar cell provided electricity for an even smaller DC motor driving both cams. The Sun Cutter project explores the potential of harnessing sunlight directly to produce objects. The machine is a low-tech, low-energy version of a laser cutter. It uses pure sunlight focused by a ball lens to repeatedly cut program shapes. The project also explores the merit of analog mechanized production that draws on the machine technology found in pre-digital machinery and automation. As the cams are set into synchronized motion by the small solar-powered motor, each pair of sunglasses made, even though very similar in shape, is still unique creating a juxtaposition between the machine-made, repetitive and individual, unique object. Then I was still a student at the Royal College of Art in London and was suffering from vitamin D deficiency and clearly my mind and body were seeking sunlight, embodied by the ideas that came to me. Then it was not really about how to change manufacturing for the better, but rather a naive search for the vitamin I was missing in cloudy London. However, this initial step and experiment made me think, sitting in the Egyptian desert, that all this emptiness actually was abundance, was rich in energy, and not only energy, but also material. The very material I was sitting on, that surrounded me as far as the eye could see, was full of potential. The last day of my short trip to Egypt I spent at the beach for people to test the sun-cut shades. <laughs> the solar center was born. The idea to only use what's right there in situ, the sun pouring down energy, and the sand I was standing on. All that was needed was a translator in between converting and literally fusing energy and matter into something new. Here, the means of getting into the desert is still a guzzling 4x4 SUV and not something like a solar-powered Tesla of the future. However, once in situ, the solar process exploration could continue. The Sun Cutter machine had been a great learning experience for me personally, and I felt ready now, having advanced my mechanical engineering skills, so I embarked on the new machine and process design of what I later called the Solar Center. The solar center machine is based on the mechanical principles of a 3D printer. A large Fresnel lens is positioned so that it faces the sun at all times via an electronic sun tracking device, which moves the lens in vertical and horizontal direction and rotates the entire machine about its base. The lens is positioned with its focal point directed at the center of the machine and at the height of the top of the sandbox where the objects will be built up layer by layer. Stepper motors drive two aluminum frames that move the sandbox in the X and Y axis. Within the box is a platform that can move the vat of sand along the vertical Z axis, lowering the box a set amount at the end of each layer cycle, allowing fresh sand to be loaded and leveled at the focal point. Two photovoltaic panels provide electricity to charge batteries, which in turn drives the motors and electronics of the machine. The photovoltaic panels also act as the counterweight for the lens, aided by additional weights 
made from bottles filled with sand. The desert can be a harsh environment. Once a sandstorm picked up the entire machine, the lens became the sail, and unfortunately, also the landing feet. But after a day of repair, everything was working again. Also, I painfully realized that my barely packaged electronics and even my laptop were not up for the energy pouring down from the sun. And we started to build cooling fans from, old, uh, from an old can, and my computer ended up on wetted stones for evaporative cooling. For me, a lot of these unforeseeable issues, or for, for me unforeseeable issues, which take improvisation with minimal equipment, are the most fun as you have to come up with a solution in no time that does the job just well enough. But for me, the notion of a translator is the heart of this project. A translator once built that does not need anything but its immediate environment to produce objects. The inputs being sand and sunlight, in material and energy, and the outputs being basic glass objects, with the real potential to be endlessly remolded into something new, as the recycling of glass actually does make sense compared to other materials which degrade through the processing chains. In glass recycling, the energy source and processing equipment are the main contributors for pollution, and if done right with concentrated solar thermal energy, a process like the solar sinter, this could almost be eliminated creating a truly sustainable material and energy cycle, harnessing abundant resources effectively. Now, what objects to make was the question. Since I was so indulged in getting this machine to work, I honestly didn't care what shape the objects had. For me, it was about the purity of the process, that it was real and working, that it was truly only using what's right there in situ, and so I had neglected giving form to any particular object outcome. What I only later realized was that people responded and connected to the simplicity of a simple bow much more so than to a more complex sculptural piece. I think that this was due to the fact that an archetypal form and the unfinished nature, the lack of distinctiveness, was relatable and helped to project many possible applications instead of a singular one. So on another level, the solar center works as a translator or vehicle to transcend an idea beyond my own imagination. The response was overwhelmingly positive and was coming from all walks of life, ages and disciplines. Kids, students, teachers and professors came up with their own individual dreams. Can you make houses? Can you build on the moon? Can you? One of the emails I got was from MIT professor Neri Oxman, asking whether I had ever thought about doing a PhD. Well, I hadn't. Nevertheless, half a year later, I entered the MIT universe, the media lab, and within the family of mediated matter. My new home led me into different spheres, projects, and multidisciplinary teams, working with biologists, material scientists, computer scientists, mechanical engineers, architects, and designers. So now, the loner working out of my 20 square meter, square meter flat in London became a team worker. In analogy to what comes next, the silkworm. From cocooning to sharing the fiber with others to achieve larger objectives. The first project I led at the Mediated Matter Group is the Silk Pavilion generally exploring fiber production. The initial idea was to investigate how the silkworm spins its cocoon and how to learn from it and translate it into technology. The first thing we did was to build a non-visual motion tracking rig, capturing the silkworm's motion while in fabrication mode, making a cocoon. This resulted in a point cloud which we wanted to use as the path for a robotic arm to mimic the silkworm's spinning behavior. We failed miserably. We soon realized that this approach wasn't working as the silkworm's head moves around erratically without extruding silk a lot of the time. While further investigating the silkworm's spinning behavior, we started to realize how spatial variations in the silkworm's environment could alter the behavior significantly. 
So this project became about involving a biological system directly into the fabrication instead of mimicking it crudely. Silkworms are incredible production machines, domesticated over thousands of years. The Bombex Mori silkworm, now blind and once a moth unable to fly, is the production means for anything silk garment. <coughs> However, the genius is only used as raw material producers with endless post-processing. The story of a silkworm goes like this. In egg hatches, the millimeter-sized worm is fed with mulberry leaves for about four weeks until it stops eating and starts extruding silk fiber, building a cocoon around its own body for around three to four days, repetitively drawing the figure eight. Once finished, the cocoon is thrown into hot water, dissolving the sericin matrix, killing the worm on the way, and the cocoon is unraveled into a single silk fiber of approximately one kilometer in length. Depending on thread count, hundreds are spun into a thicker thread, woven into a fabric, sewn into a garment, and finally shipped and sold. So what if the silkworm could make the shirt for you? What if there could be a tight collaboration between a bi biological and technological system? The Silk Pavilion explores the relationship between digital and biological fiber-based fabrication on the large scale. For the large scale, we found that sparse thread scaffolding structures work great to guide the silkworms. This gives the designer the ability to design globally the overall shape as well as apertures and densities while letting the silkworm reign free locally, doing what it does best, laying down its silk in the overlapping figure eight, creating a dense skin instead of making a cocoon. For the overall design, a friend and collaborator, Jorge Duro, created an applet taking into account all that we had learned from our experiments, digitally laying down a single fiber over a spherical design, running a sunlight path approximation, generatively designing in the apertures. This digital construct then was broken down into 26 fabricatable polygon shapes for the CNC machine with a custom thread and defector tool. Most exciting was the de de uh, deployment in the MIT Media Lab as for 10 days, people could watch the silkworms connect, tighten the skin in and around the scaffolding structure. Six and a half thousand silkworms were deployed on this structure, creating a membrane that on a local level would have been really hard to design in CAD with an approximated combined fiber length of 6.5 thousand kilometers. Finally, the concept of a fabrication cycle is introduced as we demonstrated that the silkworm does not actually need its cocoon for protection in a domesticated environment and can reproduce with potentially 25 more pavilions being made from the offsprings by providing the right temperature, humidity and mulberry leaves. Here nature could act as the input, the output and compiler merely being guided by a subtle technology for desired output. Over the course of five and a half years I spent at Mediated Matter, I worked on many collaborative projects with working with ants and bees to developing the first optically transparent glass 3D printing process. The most recent and culmination of my PhD at MIT is the Fiberboard project. This project takes a step at multi-agent robotic fabrication and is to some extent inspired by the Silk Pavilion. I believe that when we tackle new approaches in architecture, such as swarm construction, we should not try to recreate the existing ways of building, such as stacking bricks, but also aim for a new kind of architecture that reflects the methods that gave birth to it and hopefully be surprised by the outcomes that we couldn't really think of before. The Fiberbot is a robot that builds and climbs its own structure. It builds tubes with defined shapes and curvature in a sequenced fashion. The tubes are wound from a fiber composite material. We made a small production line at Mediated Matter, building 20 of these small robots to work together. 
The idea being that a new kind of architecture could be achieved by thinking of a wall as a fabric, where each robot can build a single thread of the fabric that could then become the building's wall. A single robot consists of a fiber winding arm moving vertically up and down while spinning around its inflatable body. A drive system moves the robot upwards from within the tube it builds and also can orient the robot in a desired position in accordance to onboard sensors. For this first demonstration, the robot is controlled via Wi-Fi from a central computer sending path trajectories to the robots. The trajectories were previously generatively designed using a combination of flocking algorithms and robot-constrained parameters. A large-scale structure of 4.5 meters in height was constructed using 16 robots over the period of 48 hours. This humble demonstration of these robots building a structure is, of course, as we are all dreamers, only a small stepping stone within a larger dream. Ultimately, I imagine a future where the design of a building is largely influenced by the environment it is placed in. The designer is mainly concerned with function over forms and where the aesthetic value of a building is derived from the designer's careful planning of those functions. Much like a tree planted in the built environment adapts to its surroundings to maximize the nutrients required to grow it from its roots to its crown for maximum sunlight and carbon. In this future, swarms of robots of varying functions could act not only in accordance to predefined code in their construction, but sense what is required and act on it. Some robots may collect material and energy, others may build the structural columns, while others fly around connecting these columns with tensile structures. And others, again, make sure material supplies are sufficiently replenished, ideally in every sense, from and with the immediate local environment. Now, I have to go back in time and rewind to start where I'd left off in my solar exploration. While I was indulging in insects and robots at MIT, I was still waiting for this thing to happen. The promise of design to inspire industry to follow suit in the quest for better methods to produce using solar energy and abundant materials. But not much happened. Even though the response had been overwhelming and in research developments are being made over the past seven years, a solar factory is still fiction. Even though I thought I had come up with an original idea, I stumbled across this article from 1933. Here, Will Beach had proposed large fresen lenses to desalinate water, build canals and roads. None of it was realized at the time, and the drawings seem out of scale, but these things are absolutely possible today. In our first call about design and DARPA, Ravi asked me, as so many of you, what is it you always wanted to do, or what is the unrealized project? I had to think about this a little, but my answer is a solar factory. The majority of industrial processes require some form of thermal energy, and direct thermal is already in use in some kitchens and, of course, the production of electricity. But in some cases, it should make more sense to use thermal solar energy instead of converting it first to electricity and then back to thermal with massive conversion loss. To start, we're working with a lens manufacturer in Japan to produce a lens approximately nine times the size of the solar center. This will enable us to start experimenting on a much larger scale, melting more amount of material at a time, and actually getting into the realm of an industrial process or the development thereof, producing bricks, tiles, vessels, and your ideas are welcome. We want to test all sorts of metals and glass compositions, as well as all sorts of processes. Not just 3D printing, but also molding and casting, and potentially many other industrial processes. Kaiserworks is starting fresh in Germany right now, 
and we're gearing up to make this a reality. And I quote from yesterday's talk, not knowing. Thank you. Thank you.